So we've got our first uh, panel up very shortly. It's called uh, The End of Journalism As We Know It. So I'd like to introduce uh, our facilitator, Flip Pryor. Uh, Flip's a journalist, strategist for the ABC News, analyst and investigations. She Formerly, she was with Twitter, Australia News Partnerships Manager, and the Walkley Foundation's Communications Manager, and a journalist with The West Australian. I also happen to personally know that she's a very mean karaoke singer. So uh, look out for her there. Please welcome Flip Pryor. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming down on a Sunday morning. Um, I'll get the panellists to come up here just for a moment. We've got Kevin Newen, and next is Narelda Jacobs, Jessica Warner, and Liam Phillips. So, welcome. I think we've got to sit. Oh, no. Wrong seat. Wrong seat, Kevin. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Um, so I'll tell you a bit more about these guys in a second. Before we start, I'd like to pay my respects to the Noongar Indigenous leaders, past and present, and acknowledge that this session is being held in the library that's built on their traditional lands. We are here today to discuss whether this is the end of journalism as we know it. Um, I hope not, because I don't really want to be out of a job, and I don't think any of these guys do either. Um, but we're definitely in one of the kind of the strangest and I'd say most challenging times that I've experienced in my career for a bunch of reasons that we're going to talk about today. Uh, there's a whole bunch of things that have happened that have really dramatically reshaped our industry in the past five years, and we're going to talk about some of those. We're on a bet that we're not going to get through all of it, but I promise you that we will. Um, before I introduce the rest of the panel, um, as you heard, I work with the uh, ABC in Sydney, and I'm a member of Media Diversity Australia. And I've also um, recently become the Asia Pacific rep for First Draft News, which is an international network of journalists and fact checkers headquartered at Harvard University in the USA and has been set up to <clears throat> tackle the growing problem of misinformation globally. So, first is Kevin Newen. He's a journalist with Storyful. I call him a kind of social verification ninja. He's got amazing skills. He, has, he works for the Storyful, which is the world's first social news agency. He's worked in New York, India, Washington, Dublin, Hong Kong, and today he provides support and verification skills around global conflict to News Corp Australia, ABC, The New York Times, Washington Post, Al Jazeera, the list goes on. In a former life, he was a psychologist at Sydney University. Western Sydney University, sorry, I should clarify. <laughs> it used to be called University of Western Sydney and they changed it for $20 million. I don't know how it happened there. <laughs> <laughs> this is very important for people who live in Sydney. Um, as the presenter of 10 Eyewitness News Perth for more than a decade, Narelda, ja Narelda Jacobs probably needs little introduction. She's been with the network since 2000, first as a news reporter, and then she was appointed the presenter in 2007, 11 years ago, wow. And she was the first Indigenous female news anchor for a commercial network. She shared the stage before with prime ministers, international business leaders, and humanitarian advocates. And she's also a patron of the Motor Neuron Disease Association, an ambassador for the David Warapunda Foundation, Breast Cancer Care WA, and the Disability Services Commission. I'm not sure when you sleep, Narelda. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Jessica Warriner writes for Western Suburbs Weekly, and she covers politics for community news, along with presenting Get Up Morning on RTRFM. Her words and pictures have been published in the New York Times, The Guardian, Gothamist, in various community news titles, Westerly Magazine, Time Out Australia, Film Inc. Magazine, and more. Welcome, Jessica. And finally, my colleague, Liam Phillips. We've actually worked together twice. Like me, he started his career at the West Australian newspaper. Did you start there? Was that your first job? And then he moved into digital news and relocated to London. On his return to Perth, he launched the website of the West Australian and WA Today for Fairfax Media. RIP, Fairfax, and in Sydney he spent six years as the news editor and homepage editor of the Sydney Morning Herald. He's now back in Perth and he's the digital editor for ABC News in Perth. Mm. All right. So, let's get straight into it. Is this the end of journalism? Kevin. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I, like I was starting with the easy questions. Um, <laughs> I feel like it's the end of journalism as we know it. Um, I think a lot has changed more in the past five, seven years than it has in the past 500 since like the first kind of press machine, um, which is, it's, I mean, it's a terrible thing. There's a lot of jobs that have gone. Um, journalism is, survives off 
they're fat. It survives off deep talent. Um, and we've just shed so much of it over the past kind of decade. But at the same time, um, I guess because of this space that I'm in, there's also a lot of opportunity mm -hmm. there. Um, it changes the way that we communicate. Um, there's a lot of voices that have been kind of had their chance to tell their stories that haven't been able before. I mean, yeah, I've been covering things like Black Lives Matters, um, things over in Manus Island and Nauru, um, even places you would never think, oh, would we be, you know, would we care about it, like Iran? Um, and that, it's because of that kind of shift in the way that we consume news, the way that we kind of distribute information that's allowed that to happen. Um, I feel like, I don't know, it, it's hard. There's a kind of bleak optimism that I have about it. Mm. It's really, really terrible what's happened, especially when I started, I was with Fairfax as well, so seeing so many of my old colleagues kind of go through it. But I will say that in the past five years, it's some of the best journalism I've ever seen, despite all the hardships. They're the best stories, they're the best told stories, and I don't think those stories would have been possible to tell that way um, even 10 years ago. So. It's um, a yes and a no I'm hearing there. Yeah, yes I mean, and no, or yeah. maybe. I, I mean, I used to be like a political advisor as well, so I, I'm really quite good at <laughs> Maybe we'll put a vote to the audience at the end of the session to say, do you think journalism is dead? Um, Nerelda. No, absolutely not. I think we need <laughs> journalism now more than ever before for the, all of the reasons we're about to discuss this morning. Okay. Jessica. Yeah, I think it's it's all about being innovative. We've got to find new ways of doing things because, you know, the old way isn't going to keep pushing forward, you know, prints kind of dying out, which I don't want to say because, you know, I work at a newspaper. <laughs> but we just have to keep finding new ways to tell stories. I mean, as Kevin was saying, we've just shed so many amazing, talented reporters. We've got the New York Daily News over in New York City. They had something like 400 journalists back in the 80s, 90s. Now they're down to about 40. And you just see that amount of people just trying to produce the same quality news. Mm. But yeah, it's, I guess I'm in the same, I'm in the same group. It's a bit of, you're on the yes fence. And no, I'm on the fence, but I'm hopeful. On the I'm fence, hopeful. okay. Yeah. Liam. Definitely not the end of journalism. But it's interesting because I think you'll find at the moment there's more journalism being produced probably than ever before. There's definitely more people consuming journalism than they have ever before. Um, a lot of the, the big news companies are having their audiences growing, growing and growing and hitting new records. But you're getting fewer journalists producing it. And I think that's one of the big problems. Mm. Um, journalism, the economics of journalism is getting really squeezed and that means that there's more people being laid off. But perversely, there's a bigger audience than ever before. So mm. I think that's something that we have to reconcile. And I think that's something that's starting to happen, is people are actually attributing a tangible value to journalism, mm. which I don't think they've done maybe over the last 10 years or so. And I'm, I'm kind of optimistic that a corner's starting to be turned there. OK. And that's, um, I just want to touch on the kind of the arrival of the, the big international players, because I think that goes to what you're saying. Mm. Um, in Sydney, you've got the New York Times has set up a Sydney bureau, um, because they know that that's where they can grow some subscribers. Yep, that's right. And I think um, ultimately this is, a, this is great news for people who like reading good journalism. You know, if you look at 20 years ago, it would have been really, really hard for someone in Perth to read the New York Times. Mm. Um, whereas now, anyone can read it. And you can either pay for it or you can casually read it if you don't read that much. But um, it's made some of the best journalism in the world so much more accessible to people who want to read good journalism. Mm. Um, the issue is uh, making sure that we've got good journalism produced locally. And that's where some of the economics make it, uh, are starting to make it difficult. Mm. And there's, um, we're getting um, uh, the big brands are starting to you know, acquire or team up with, um, with producers here. So we've obviously, we used to have the, the Fairfax and Huffington Post partnership, that, that doesn't exist anymore. The Guardian's in town, SBS is teaming up with Vice. Um, Nerelda, Channel 10 was recently acquired by CBS News. Has much changed for you day to day since that happened? There's been no change at all. In fact, uh, the change is only positive because we're expanding and we're actually hiring people. Uh, the newsrooms, Channel 10 newsrooms around the country were running on the smell of an oily rag. Um, a lot of the, you know, um, Perth, Melbourne, um, Brisbane and Adelaide, were, we were covering the stories of um, the cities uh, and around the state with about three journos, can you believe it? And uh, in my heyday, when I was on the road at 10, we had 11 journos covering Perth alone, you know? <laughs> so to do it with three, and, um, and that was in Melbourne as well. Um, Sydney had a couple more, like they were 
had five, you know. Mm. Um, so now we're hiring uh, network wide and uh, and expanding. So it's only good, and they and CBS hasn't put their stamp on our brand at all. Mm. Uh, just yet. Um, whether they do in time, we'll see. But um, they've just let us do what we've always done, and you know we're quite a trusted um, brand in news locally, so that's continuing. And now you've just got a bit more money to spend, presumably. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Which is only good for people at home watching the news because we can cover we can cover more news. We can, you know, mm. um, yeah. And we're. Um, I guess journos aren't spread as thin. Like we, we yep. always, you know, even with three journos, you would still try and cover everything. Mm -hmm. um, but you would find that people would get burnt out, you know, by, by doing it because you would just, you know, you, it, it's nice to be able to come in to, today and say, look, let's just do what we can do. But it, the reality, when news breaks, you have to get it to air. Yeah. You know, so that, that's the challenge we face. And we'll keep facing it no matter how many journos you have in the <laughs> yeah. newsroom. Well, I'd like um, all of you to paint a picture because I don't think this doesn't really make its way into the public domain a lot. But over the last five years, journalism has changed dramatically inside newsrooms. And I just want you to kind of paint me a picture of just how different it is and what the expectations are of a journalist in a newsroom these days compared to just five years ago. Well, so for me, um, five years ago, I was working at the Sydney Morning Herald. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that was a very kind of tumultuous time there. M maybe just a little, bit bef a little bit further ago than five years ago, maybe more like about seven years ago, um, the Sydney Morning Herald did a, or across Fairfax, there was a massive project to basically turn the newsroom upside down. Um, when I joined there in 2011, it was still very much a print-focused um, operation. So you'd have about 80% of the newsroom was devoted to the newspaper, just the paper. And then there was this ragtag bunch of about 20% of us in the corner who were um, devoted to the um, online news. Um, and then they basically decided to complete, completely flip that on its head. And so what you had is uh, the whole newsroom essentially was devoted to, to creating online news and then that was repurposed to create the newspaper. So we were still uh, following the same news, but it was just in terms of the production of it, mm. the, the focus was very much changed. Um, now I think it would, you would find that kind of uh, print focused operation would be, there would be few, few places around the place where, where you'd be able to, to justify that. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, the digital side of news production has really come to the fore. Um, and I think there's a lot more sophistication around it as well. Mm. It's not just about chasing your tail with reactive news. People are actually putting a lot more thought into it. And there's a lot more um, energy and efforts and resources put into how are we going to present a really good, deep investigative story in a powerful digital way. Mm. I think one of the big things is, especially for younger journos coming through, there's so much of an emphasis on being a multimedia journalist. I mean, you kind of, it gets bandied around in university, like you have to train in all of these areas to make sure you can cover them. But I think these skills are actually being utilised in a way that they weren't before. Mm. So you might have done, you know, a video unit in uni and you think, oh yeah, I'll never use that unless I do broadcast. But no, now if you're in print, if you're on, if you're working online, like you need to know that. You need to be able to assemble these videos and get these things done. So I think there's, yeah, a lot more of an emphasis on being an all-rounder. For sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the the race to get something on Twitter. That's mm. that's the challenge. Um, w <laughs> I think probably five years ago you might. Um, hold on to a story until your evening news, whereas now I think the ABC is all about online first. Is mm. that online first and then so you don't actually, yep. um, you don't save anything for the seven o'clock bulletin. People have already seen it. Exactly. Which is really bizarre because that's, you know, the seven o'clock bulletin is, that, that's the end game, really, for the whole day, whereas now it's not. It's, it's about online throughout the day. Um, it's become a lot more similar yeah. to... In, in print newsrooms, you used to save stuff for the paper, mm. and now it's not. You know, if you've got a good story, you put it up when yeah. is the best time to publish it for digital. And the ABC's come around to the same re realisation when it comes to the 7pm news. They're very different audiences. They're consuming news for very different reasons and in very different ways. And so if you've got a good story, you put it up when it's the best time to put it up online. You don't hold it for some other reason. Yeah, we're definitely seeing that in the papers, for sure. I mean, even last year when I started at Community, you'd kind of, you'd save your really big stories for the front page. Like, you save them for, you know, 
it might be in a few days' time, might be in a week's time. But now, like, you definitely get it up online first, which is always interesting when you see, you know, how many people have already read this online by the time that the paper comes out? Yeah. And I think a lot of that's because there's been a growing respect for the digital audiences. You know, people want to read good news at the time that suits them, mm. not at the time that suits the newsroom. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have a bit of a different perspective. I guess because I came into journalism only like three and a half years ago, so I haven't had that kind of legacy or heritage. But uh, when I first got into, well, started in the Fairfax newsroom, they were using the term digital age in the future tense uh, when we hit the digital age. So it kind of says a lot about how far behind they were. Um, I'm in a luxurious position in that I don't have deadlines. I don't have to put things up ahead of time because nobody besides other journalists see my work. But um, I will say this. Um, when I see a lot of young journos go through the newsroom, and there's this kind of expectation that they are multimedia journalists, that they are all-rounders, um, which is really, really great, and especially because they're digital natives, they kind of have a they're much more in tune with this kind of social sphere, which has become so... It's become compulsory now. Like oh. You can't have news without the social sphere. Um, but I will say this, because there's so much of the top-tier talent that has now just kind of gone, it's vanished, they've been made redundant, or they've gone on to somewhere else, um, the kind of basic tenets of journalism, which is, aren't particularly complicated, you know, journalism as fancy as we might like to make it be, or it is at the end of the day, something happens, reporter goes, asks questions, comes back and tells you what you find. And I find that a lot of young journos these days are having trouble kind of grasping that because they don't have that kind of um, mentorship. They don't have those people, or there's not as much of them around to kind of show them how to do something so simple and so important. So I will say, that's my kind of experience, especially since I've worked in so many yeah. different newsrooms nowadays, um, where there are, there are massive gaps that, sh that weren't there when I, I kind of considered going to journalism like four years ago. And I think that's something that's not always valued by the people who are making the decisions around the redundancies. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. A lot of experience has been lost. Mm. And um, you've all touched on the platforms. We need to talk about the platforms. <laughs> I think um, one thing to consider is, you know, we might look at someone like The Guardian and think they're a, pl a competitor these days, but now we are competing with Netflix, we're competing with all of the big international players for eyeballs. Um, but the arrival of social platforms really drastically shifted the news landscape in a lot of different ways. Um, economically, they've been pinpointed as being the, the source of, you know, the, the loss of income for news. Um, but they've also created massive differences in the ways that we're expected to interact with audiences as journalists. Um, you know, I think we moved along from this idea of just kind of disseminating news into now we have to talk to people. And a lot of journalists, do they find that uncomfortable still, that, that expectation that now you need to kind of respond to audience feedback, potentially interact with them in a Facebook group or a Reddit AMA or interact with them through Facebook Live? Is that still quite new for journalists, do you think? I think um, uh, the smart journalists see that there's more opportunity here than cost. Um, there's a lot of these places, they, they, you know, Facebook, for example, they're an amazing forum to contact people um, and contact people a lot more easily than you used to be. So, um, and I think um, a lot of people see that there's a value in cultivating their audience and, and, and um, a lot of journalists also see the value in creating themselves as a personal brand. Mm. Um, you know, you look at some of the most well-known journalists around the country, people like your kind of Kate McClymonts, and they have personally huge followings on a lot of these social media um, platforms. And that's because they've seen the value in that. And it's kind of, uh, it's empowering the journalists to be thinking beyond their current employers and to think what's their kind of ongoing value to whoever may decide to, to hire them or use their work. Mm. Um. I think if they do it right, it can be really, really valuable, mm. but I don't think a lot of people do. Yeah. <laughs> I think yeah. that's true. Um, but I have seen it used quite successfully on Reddit, for example, the Washington Post are on Reddit, mm. um, and they answer, you know, they keep a story alive there because they have maybe 150,000 eyeballs there, like every day at least, um, just through the stories that get posted, not even by themselves, but by people mm. who are readers, loyal readers, that kind of put it up to engage them. Um, and that's really, really valuable because that's just something that they couldn't have done before. Mm. Um, but other times, there's a kind of cynicism that goes with that as well. Um, people, I suppose they can kind of, kind of see through it and there's like this is obviously a kind of commercial grab. You're just doing this for publicity or 
um, this isn't kind of real journalism, and I feel like there's a double-edged sword that um, a lot of people kind of fall on. Well, it's very immediate these days, isn't it? You used to have to wait for a letter to the editor to be sent in and then arrive a week later sometimes, <laughs> and then you'd finally get the feedback on your story. Now you put something out and immediately someone comes straight back at you with a comment or a, you know, angry a response, yeah, an angry tweet. Me. Everyone <laughs> has to deal with the angry tweets. But one thing I find reassuring is that there, these networks show that there is a huge amount of people out there who mm. want to read and talk about the news. Um, um, we usually look mostly at Facebook because that's where, how I like to say, more real people are. Um, Twitter is, is very overpopulated by journalists and politicians and academics, um, but Facebook has, has far more engagement with the general public. Um, and loads and loads of people out there are really interested in news and really interested in sharing news, talking about news, and, and reacting to news. And I think that's something that you can really take a lot of heart from as a journalist. Yeah, you made a comment about now, for the first time ever, journalists are able to see how people feel about the news, as opposed to, you know, like, you had very little information before, right? That's right. And, and so it's given rise to what we call uh, emotional analytics. So we've had analytics uh, for a long time which tell people uh, which tell us what stories people are watching. And that's absolutely invaluable because it puts us more in tune with the audience. Uh, and what we want to do is know what the audience is wanting and be able to present stories that will be in the shape that you guys are looking for. Um, for a long time, we've been able to tell what people are reading and like how long they've been reading it for. But it's become more sophisticated now. So we can do things like we can test different headlines that are tailored to different things and we can measure which one people react to the best. So we can tailor a headline based around a vested interest or based around an emotion or based around a surprising fact. And we can see, well, which one of those are you actually going to respond to? And then we can factor that in, not just to that story, but to any future stories. When we write about this, we might think, well, the last time we, did, we covered this issue, we covered it with a really emotional story about someone who was affected by it. And people really, really liked that. They found that a really engaging way to get into that story. And that's just knowledge that we can do that familiarizes ourselves more with what you guys think. Um, but also when it comes to the social space, for the first time we can measure not only how, many, uh, how much people are reading a story, but what they thought about it. So did they like it? Did they ha-ha it? Did they love it? Did they <laughs> angry face it? Um, and, and also through the comments, it gives us a much better idea of how people are feeling about issues. And that can inform whether it's something that we should follow up with future stories, whether it's something that people just aren't interested in at all. Um, we've, we found that recently. We, we did quite a few stories when there was um, uh, the, the police were, um, uh, were having a fight with the government over their pay. And we thought, this is a really important story that people presumably will want to know about. We tried covering that story in every single way possible, and no one ever read it. Mm -hmm. And no one ever responded to it, and no one ever commented on it. So we drew the conclusion after about seven stories Basically, you guys don't care. Unless you're a police officer, you don't really care how much police officers are paid. I want to ask a question of the audience, actually, maybe just hands up. Um, how many of you out there feel like mainstream media has lost touch with audiences in Australia? One guy. OK, a few more hands. OK. So that's interesting. I think a lot of the talk these days, um, especially in the US after the election, there was a lot of talk about how media had lost touch with the people, that we didn't really know what the people wanted, that we weren't covering the story. We didn't get the story. Um, Jessica, this is a really interesting area for you because you work in kind of grassroots community journalism. Yep. And I kind of find it amusing sometimes that when we talk about strategies for re-engaging with people. A lot of it is about actual journalism like the old days, like boots on the ground, being in the communities that you're reporting on, people knowing who you are. Is that something that you feel like we Actually, can learn? I was going to bring that up before when we were talking about Facebook. Um, Facebook can be such a good tool, especially in local journalism, to kind of get your finger on the pulse for what people are thinking and do it with a large group of people. Like, if you... There's so much to be said for having boots on the ground, and I think that's really important as well, because people can tell when you've just kind of come into a community and you don't really know a lot about it. But Facebook is great for getting a sample, like a bigger sample size. You couldn't do that going, you couldn't go around to, you know, 100 people in a neighbourhood and get as much data as you could from looking at like a Facebook post. We've something. got a problem with Facebook though, right? And I want to ask you guys about filter bubbles because does everyone know what a filter bubble is? It basically refers to the fact that because social media platforms are controlled by algorithms, which are very mysterious, we don't even know how they work, and those algorithms, based on what you do online and the little breadcrumbs that you leave as you navigate your way through the internet, um, social networks will show you information that it thinks you want to see. 
because Facebook effectively wants you to stay on Facebook as long as possible. And by showing you stuff that you're more likely to engage with or more likely to be interested in, it keeps you there. So this is what we're dealing with. As news organisations um, in the digital space, we've lost control of the distribution of news. It's largely been ceded to Google and Facebook and other platforms, which is a really interesting issue for us. Um, just a really great example was after Brexit, I couldn't actually find anybody that was happy. Um, and despite <laughs> me kind of like, I got like, what, I'm following like 2,000 people on Twitter. Um, I got like a couple hundred Facebook friends at the time, and then I couldn't find anyone that was pleased despite the fact. And that's a filter bubble. That is, yeah, that's, one that's the perfect <laughs> example there was of echo chamber. Um, there was yeah. a very interesting project that was um, developed by, I think it's the Wall Street Journal. It's called the Red Feed, Blue Feed. Um, it's worth looking up because it's, it's a really interesting insight into the polarization of news in America. And what they did was basically they created two different Facebook accounts and liked a whole heap of different stories based on um, the partisan coverage of news. And so what you can do is, at any time, you can pull up what someone who's a very right-wing, conservative, uh, Republican reader thinks about the news of the day, and someone who's a very left-wing, Democrat, liberal newsreader thinks about exactly the same events of the day and see not only what's covered, but how it's covered. And it is really, really scary that you mm. get completely different mm. perspectives on exactly the same set of news. I follow yeah, an account that retweets um, Trump's tweet. Uh, the, the Twitter accounts that Trump follows, there's an account that you can see what those accounts tweet. So you can actually see what Donald Trump's worldview looks like via Twitter. And it's a very interesting place. <laughs> um, Imagine it's just like I a wanna, screaming cat. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of very interesting stuff. Now, I want to talk about control of news as well, because that's been another massive shift. Narelda, we can um, look at your examples in a second. Because mm -hmm. before the, the platforms came along, we used to be the purveyors of truth, right? We were the, the gatekeepers of the information. It was basically us and public officials. Um, now everyone is a broadcaster. Everyone has a phone in their pocket, and this is the stuff that really is feeding the news cycle these days. Yep, everyone's a citizen journalist, and I think journos on the road, the first stop is to grab the eyewitnesses, to grab the shops, to grab the businesses that are nearby. Have you got CCTV? Mm. Did you film it? You know, that is the first question journos ask before they even speak to the cops or the emergency services <laughs> workers, because that the vision is gold, you know, for TV and even for print as well, because, you know, mm. you're putting it online. So, uh, and that, that is the race. That is the race of journos to get the best vision. And um, what, a, uh, what a lot of the commercial networks will do is to make, to make sure that they get that vision exclusively. They'll offer money to people uh, who have filmed it. Um, I'm not talking about a lot of money, depending on, you know, on what they filmed, but um, Channel 10, we don't, um, you know, unless it's extraordinary, we don't have a budget for that sort of thing. So we just have, you know, once there's money involved, we just give up because um, we're out of the race. But uh, that's the first, that's the first uh, step. And, you know, people are, people are generally happy to share it um, for free. I mean, they probably put it on their Facebook page anyway, and then it's available. Once they do that, it's available for everyone for nothing. Um, yeah, but that's, that's it. Yeah, so... Let's I've, have a look at a couple of examples I've, that you've got here. So I think the first example, what's this one? The, the first example that? is um, from, Monday, from Monday, I, um, the Toronto shooting, really... Here it is. Oh. You can, oof, you can see that. That's the. So we just pause it there. Um, so that is the gunman from Toronto uh, earlier this week, and I think you know the aftermath pictures that we all saw from uh, from that shooting in um, Toronto was you know the emergency services, the cops, and the ambos, and the flashing lights, and all that sort of stuff. And I think we're all used to seeing the aftermath of emergencies and um, mass shootings and that sort of thing, but. When you actually see that chilling moment of just a normal street, people going about their everyday business, and um, the audio on that piece of footage was someone on their balcony at home trying to figure out where's the noise coming from? Is it coming from that car? Is it? And, and then, and then you see that you know you see the gunman come into shot, and mm. he's just firing into a restaurant where you know families are just enjoying dinner, you know, they might be enjoying a birthday celebration or something, and then to know that people have died from that and people are, you know, fighting for their lives in hospital after that, just a very normal situation. I think it really changes the story and um, that, that vision just went all, you know, went around the world. Um, mm. But it really hits home because I think we, we are desensitised to seeing flashing lights and, you know, the aftermath of, situ you know, um, emergencies, but, but, you know, but seeing the actual moment speaks mm. volumes about 
you know, it, it, yeah, it, it really um, makes it hit home. Yeah, and let's have a look at the next one. It's um, drug-affected chainsaw bloke. Yeah, that's how I described it. <laughs> that was in, um, in the Bunnings car park in Cannington. Oh my God. Yes. <laughs> Incredible. <laughs> what he does next is pretty bizarre. <laughs> just and then, he, some Benny Hill then he puts his hands there. up to get handcuffed. Um, so if that you... Was, that was his response to get down on the ground, wasn't yeah. it? I mean, the guy's got <laughs> right. style. Yeah. So if... I, I'm not, I can't remember what he'd been charged with, but if we had just read that charge sheet, it would have been boring and we would have gone, nah. You know, not newsworthy, what are we going to do? Go and shoot an empty car park at Bunnings, you know? Um, but once you see the vision, then it suddenly makes it a story. And that's been viewed over and over and over because it was just bizarre, you know? <laughs> um, and he, he was damaging his own car as well if it was, you know, and he uh, stripped down to his undies. Considerate of that, actually, yes, yeah. very considerate, yeah. And the, the last example we've got here is a, um, a FaceTiming and yes. cereal eating driver. And this is something that we can all do any time of the day or night when we're on the road and we see someone behaving badly behind the wheel. This, <laughs> this poor girl, I feel sorry for her that we all Oops. have seen her face now. She was FaceTiming behind the wheel. I'm very really sorry if she's amongst you. Um, and then this lady was eating her um, cereal at the wheel, having breakfast with no hands. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we're... I, <laughs> I hate these videos because, <laughs> because I don't think they're newsworthy, you know, but mm. once other... Um, Newsrooms pick it up and you see it on their social media. And you scramble. see how many likes it gets and how many yeah. comments and stuff. You have to put, you have to run it. You have to run it, you know, because... It's at, because all of you are clicking on it, by the way. Yes. If you weren't clicking on it, it wouldn't run. Exactly. So it's and, your fault, really. Yeah. <laughs> it's all and that is the yourself. stuff that gets the most views. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's the stuff that gets the most views, not the, you know, stuff that really important things that are happening in, in law and, um, and justice and, and, you know, education yeah. and health and all those really important issues. That that is the stuff that it's people yeah. FaceTime, pe people actually eating their cereal or doing their makeup behind the wheel. Oh, there was one that I didn't, um, yeah. that I didn't include. We got uh, sent um, a, a driver um, doing an indecent act behind the wheel, which only allowed him to drive with one hand. So you can imagine what he was doing with the other hand. Um, and he wasn't playing the drums because we had, um, was investigating because you couldn't see the actual indecent act, but you could see the motion of it and he wasn't playing the drums. <laughs> but um, yeah, so we decided not to put that. <laughs> Sometimes because it's just, a step too far. We just, yeah, it just, we, that was crossing the I line. Think, um, I think everyone in Australia ran the recent poo jogger story and there was oh, a very vigorous yes. debate in, the, in our newsroom where they finally said, we're yeah. not running the poo jogger story. Yeah. And if you don't know it, I'm sorry, I'm not going to tell you what it is. You have to look it up later. I don't but, think um, you need to know anything more no, than what yeah. you just said. Yeah, exactly that sums it up, basically. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But it's interesting. Like, you get this thing and once everyone else has done it, yeah. Your newsroom kind of just follows. So. And I, I was sort of glad that day that the ABC decided, no, that's, that's, a, that's too low a bar for us. You're going to regret not covering that when yeah. One Nation taps them for pre-selections. <laughs> yeah. But I, I, think, I think the message there is... Um, <laughs> I think, <Not> you know, <laughs> just don't film people behaving badly behind the wheel. I mean, chances yeah. are you're driving yourself, and, you know, unless you've got a passenger just, filming it. I just, just on that note, though, it's not just, like, behind a wheel. There's sometimes people will film you without context and it can actually ruin lives mm. as well. I think the big one, even with really, really good intentions. Anyone know the, the, the plane bay story? And the pretty girl on the plane, that how they had to... That creepy, yeah. Was, I mean, at the time, I was, even I admit, I was super invested. So the story is, um, someone gave up their seat and they ended up kind of, you know, this kind of romance story that they were filming from behind and kind of chronicling the entire thing. And you think it's a really, really sweet story, but... It ended up like the young lady got doxxed and things like that. And you have it's to just, explain doxing, Kevin. Doxing means basically <laughs> from, from what I can gather from public information records. Um, so I can find your Facebook, which means maybe I could find where you work, which means I can find where you live, where you study, all your things. Basically putting your personal information online so I can therefore find you mm. or like letting people know about you. And you know, even with that, with the absolute best of intentions, um, that. You know, she had to shut down her social media. She was getting slut shamed. She was like, people were DM, DMing her very kind of inappropriate um, pictures or texts. Um, and it's just kind of what it is because there's no, I, it comes back to the whole gatekeeping thing as well. Yeah. Like, we make those decisions to not run the Poo Juggle story, for yeah. example. And I can't believe I said that like with a completely straight face. But <laughs> um, on something like that, where everyone thinks they're assistant journalists or um, yeah. they're broadcasting themselves, there's no rules, there's no ethics. They're, they're not 
taught. There's no, um, there's no kind of, there's probably no legal ramifications to what they do. There's no price for what they do, other than they may, might apologise or they might. And when something goes viral, it can be disastrous for people. Yeah, yeah, I mean, if you someone lose complete turns into agency. a meme or something, like, yeah, imagine it can turning into a meme. It would yeah. be like the worst thing in the world. It's yeah. like you lose your entire sense of agency. You become this. And object. you've lost control over that. I mean, you probably didn't have control to begin with. If someone else is just filming you while you're doing something stupid, walking down the street, yeah. it could have been, you know, a few seconds, but that lasts forever. Mm -hmm. And this is a problem when you know everyone is a publisher now. It's kind of the the rules and um, you know ABC is governed by very strict rules about what we do and don't publish, and we are pretty strict, which I'm happy about. Um, but, you know, if you're just someone with a phone in your pocket, you don't think necessarily about ethics or whether you're about to cause serious harm to someone's life or all of that sort of stuff that we have to think about in journalism every day. Yep. I want to talk a bit about what you do, Kevin, because it's when these kind of videos surface, there's a mad scramble to be the first to get it out online because people know it has viral potential. Uh, Kevin, what do you do? You, your job is very particular. Yeah. So it's about as vague as your one. <laughs> so, uh, so my job basically is um, verification journalism. So before anything, when something happens, uh, whether it is something as simple as cute kangaroos jumping down the street or it's um, you know a barrel bombing in Aleppo in Syria, uh, my job is essentially is there vision, is there photos, what can we know about it? Um, the information goes through our newsroom and it's checked by journalists. So at, the, at this point in time, well, the general rule was that in journalism, before you run something, you needed two points of confirmation before you ran for it. Um, Lisa Davies from the Sydney Morning Herald came out, I think, last year and said, two is impossible, we work with one now, um, which is kind of like a blow. But uh, in our newsroom, we have six to eight points of verification before we publish. Um, and How we much have can you find out about people, Kevin? Like, you, could, I, uh, you could pretty easily track down everyone I, I in the think, audience, I right? Think, I think the scariest thing that I've ever done was this young lady, when I was looking at dust storms in Arizona, um, she posted a time-lapse video of like an empty desert road. Um, and from that video, I was able to kind of track exactly where she lived. And I had to kind of uh, message her after, like, you know, we ran the story. I was kind of like, hey, just so you know, um, there's these kind of vulnerabilities there. And it's something for everyone to kind of think about how much information you put online. Um, you're not really sure because you keep forgetting because there's just such a huge quantifiable amount of it. Yeah, yeah. and you know, there's, um, if you put stuff on Facebook and you don't have very good privacy settings, that's the first place journalists go when they're looking for information. But they can use what they find on Facebook to then find you on other networks and start yeah. to build a digital picture of you. Yeah, it's, you know, there's a whole thing where it's like you can tell someone by their shopping cart or something like that, what they kind of buy. Like, they can tell that you're pregnant before you, you even know, based mm. on the foods. Um, but in as much the same way, your digital footprint is forever. That's a really mm. horrifying thing, um, which is why the GD, is it G R G D P R G D P R. <laughs> the privacy letters. rules. Yeah, the privacy rules were introduced, and, and as inconvenient as they can be, they're very, very important at the moment. I'm wondering if we might show some of the examples, or just skip ahead a second. Um, hmm. Lots of this information deliberately sets out to fool journalists. Yeah, so, so there, there is a growing, increasing, or. Oh, Tautology there, but there's a growing number of people, or and whether they're just pranksters or trolls, or whether there are, uh, as we kind of been learning over the past year in horror, um, foreign agencies uh, putting out disinformation um, for the purpose of con taking control of the narrative. Because the trade-off to having everyone have a voice is that um, the people who are responsible, the ones with good intentions, um, have less control over what the narrative is. So um, I think what would the... We'll look at some examples. Yeah. I think we're going to start with Lion Takes Revenge. Yeah. So I can't tell if there's volume or not. Here? Yeah, the sound. Rush that one. He's so big. Yeah. Put the gun up. Look straight down the camera. To the right. I've left the camera running, so we'll get a good few, get a few shots here for the uh, for the wall at home, huh? Oh, he'll <laughs> on the wall. No, that's good. Hey, that was a really good shot, princess. No, no, no good, good. You. Best one we've had all season. Oh, really? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Oh. No, at least 200 kgs. Wow. Huh? Dad is gonna lose his mind over that. <laughs> it's not so big now, eh, no. pussycat? <laughs> right, okay. Let's take one of these, huh? Get your guns out. Oh, these That's ones? It. Yeah, these ones, yes. That's it. Oh, go, pump them. That's it. Uh, are you going to work on them? Oh, body? come on. <laughs> right, let me... Yeah, well... <laughs> right, I'll just check the camera, yeah? Okay. That's right. Okay, good stuff. <laughs> Fuck! 
<laughs> Was that real or fake? Who thinks it's real? No one? No one wants to put that. Oh, thank God. All right. Um, because some newsrooms thought that was real. Mm -hmm. um, so um, this video was part of a series uh, released by a production company called Woolshed. They released about eight or nine videos um, over the course of one or two years. And between all of them, they racked up 205 million views, uh, and they, which means they probably hit a, like a, maybe a rate of a billion, depending on the metrics there. Um, which is quite horrifying. Um, they came out and said this was a prank, this was a social experiment, not a prank, but a social experiment to see how things kind of go viral, it was a bit of a study. But something like that comes up quite often. You'd be very, very surprised about how often these videos do come up and how close some newsrooms go to publishing them. Um, I, for those who might not know what I do, my position is I work with different news companies to make sure that what they put up is true or not. And we get, we some, get caught out a lot, don't we, unfortunately? Yeah, I, I, it's not, I mean, I wouldn't say it's like an incompetence thing. Um, I feel like you're so quick, and some of these are becoming increasingly sophisticated as well, so that was, that was quite easy to work out. It took us about maybe 10 seconds. Should we um, look at um, Sex Crocodile? Sex Crocodile. I think sex Crocodile. <laughs> <laughs> no, if nothing comes up, yeah. So this was a really, really great one um, that was picked up by India today. This was a story about a man over in Cairns um, who reportedly got high on meth and then tried to have sex with a crocodile and was subsequently <laughs> killed. Um, and it was really, really funny having to call the cops to confirm that story. <laughs> um, but things that we don't think get picked up do. So this is just one example of how it was collected, but over um, different national websites, or sorry, international websites ran it, and I think it got like 1.2 million people had shared or liked or commented on the story. Um, and this is just one example of, it was, wasn't even satire, I'm not really 100% sure what it was. <laughs> but if we can go to the, um, the next one. The next one. And these are the ones that are the most dangerous. So we work a lot with disinformation campaigns here. And if anyone who doesn't recognize him, he's one of the Parkland, Florida survivors, who then became a very, um, very, very prominent anti-gun advocate there. Um, hands up the moment you realize what's wrong with this tweet. Yeah. You saw. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone uh, notice it at all? If you didn't catch that, it's actually sent from Moscow. Yeah. So it's never quite this obvious, um, obviously. Mm. <laughs> um, but there, this is one example of a foreign agency um, that is trying to kind of take control of the narrative for often nefarious purposes. So this, this, these kind of things are really, really concerning because newsrooms see it, but they don't actually address it. And for a long time, I've been advocating that newsrooms during breaking news situations um, should be talking about fake news. Fake, yeah. um, every instance of me saying fake news is in inverted commas there. Um, but in this instance, what ends up happening is that we don't talk about things that people don't comment because we are so obsessed with the metrics of clicking and liking and sharing, and it's all great. But these are the kind of things that people see think about, they absorb that information and they move on without any kind of critical engagement. And these are the kind of things that over time build up over and over. And this is a really, really great example as well. So when the Black Panther movie came out, um, great movie, you've seen it twice, um, they, there was this kind of series of fake photos and fake tweets coming out showing that um, these white people were getting attacked at predominantly black theaters. Um, this was fake. Uh, this was from some Swedish television show in 2012, not from 2018. Uh, but they're prominent. They get shared hundreds of thousands of times um, by real people. Ask, how often, so Liam, look, you, you're working in digital news, and this sort of stuff is coming across your desk all the time. Journalists have to be pretty skeptical of everything they see these days, right? Particularly when it comes through social media. Absolutely, yeah. You really have to, you look at all of these things with a real grain of salt. And, and our um, policy at the ABC is basically, if we can't speak to the people who posted it, yep. we're not gonna do a story. Yep. Um, and the trouble is, sometimes you can even do that and still get caught out. Um, one time that, that I remember uh, when I was working for the Sydney Morning Herald, we had a story, there was a picture that had been circulated um, that someone had taken underwater at Bondi Beach of a diver and there was a great white shark in the background looming menacingly. Um, and we, caught, we thought, well, that's an amazing picture if that's real. And so we did our checks on it. We, we ran it through. You can, there are online programs where you can run a picture through it to see if it's been photoshopped. 
that was inconclusive as to whether it was or whether it wasn't because the, the shark was kind of very grainy in the background. So we actually rang and spoke to the diver. So this is a guy who runs a professional diving school who took the photo and he said in an interview on the record, yep, it's genuine, there was a shark there, it's absolutely true, we were amazed we got out of it. So we wrote a story on that basis. We went, well, this guy, he's on the record, said who he is, he's got a business, he's had his business identified, why would someone do all of that? And, and he lied. Why? And then we wrote a story. And then the, day, the next day it came out that he had bald-faced lied to us and the photo was mocked up and it was fake. And so we wrote a story about that. Yeah. Um, because, you know, if this guy wants to put his business on the line and then lie to us, well, everyone should know that that guy's a liar. And this is but, but, not uncommon, right? I mean, this is a problem. I mean, like, admit it. Have any of you guys been fooled by something that you've seen and you've thought, without the, the direct lie, and you've thought, oh, we, sh we could run that, but the last minute you might have thought, oh, better not. There's definitely things you come across where you just think, oh, I'm not so sure about that. I'll wait for someone else to run it and get it wrong. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm, I'm just not touching that. And we were talking about that before because mm. there's a huge problem for us if, that, if a verified account on Twitter in a newsroom or, or a top journalist tweets something and says, this is, this is true, and then it spreads like wildfire. And if they get it wrong, we almost have a higher standard of proof these days because mm. if we get it wrong and it goes really, really wrong. Um, there was a really famous case after the Boston bombing of two guys wrongly being identified as the perpetrators and it was picked up by several news outlets and as a result it went global and one guy didn't exist and one guy had actually killed himself days earlier. Mm. There so, was also the one, the, uh, the London Bridge terror attacks. Yeah. The first person who was identified was in prison at the time of the attack. That's right, yeah. Uh, another example is um, Prince Philip. Um, you might remember. Yeah. He's always dying. <laughs> yeah, he's always dying. But um, <laughs> Buckingham Palace was putting out a release, an important release, um, something, you know, about two o'clock in the afternoon, I think, mm. for the time. And um, on, on Twitter, it had already spread that he had died. Yeah. Yeah. And that was when he was stepping back from. Credible journos were actually reporting it. Um, fortunately, our newsroom did not. And. Um, yeah, and, and even though, you know, local people were saying, why aren't you reporting that Prince Philip died? Well, we're like, well, we don't know that he's died yet. Let's mm. wait to see what Buckingham Palace is. And they're just saying that he stepped down from public duties. Um, but another thing was um, the Kalgoorlie riots come to mind as well because social media just, it just went wild. The speculation mm. about the... Um, well, I can call him the killer now because he's been done for manslaughter, but um, there was wild speculation about... Uh, what he ha what he had done, and it was really inflaming um, mm. Mm. the powder keg, the, the, how it's been described in Kalgoorlie. And uh, even my my daughter said, you know, why aren't you reporting what everyone's saying about uh, about this bloke that's been accused of it? And I said, well. <laughs> It's only on social media. It's not true, you know. And and um, and it wasn't. A lot of the allegations on social media weren't true, but it really inflamed. Mm. You know, if we had gone to air with that, then people would have. It would have made the situation way worse. Mm. So you need to have restraint. Uh, mm. And and even though you, I think that the. the um, it, the, the, the rule is that even though you've got it, you don't have to run it. Yeah. You know? And, and also, that's... Even, even with um, media kind of disseminating all over the place, uh, the big media players still have an incredibly loud voice that they speak with and really reach a lot of people. Mm. Um, and one thing that, that um, I remember is when the, uh, the Qantas flight um, uh, with the, the oxygen canister or something blew out and blew a hole in the side of the plane and it had to make an emergency landing. When that first came across, like, people had found... Uh, part of the, the uh, wreckage of the fuselage of the plane on the ground and everyone was saying a Qantas plane has crashed and that was what some of the early um, publishers were actually reporting as there are reports a Qantas plane has crashed. Mm. Now people would know who their relatives are who are on that plane. If you're reporting that a plane has crashed and making people believe that their relatives have died because let's be honest if a plane has crashed the chances of you surviving are not great. That's a huge amount of trauma to put people through mm. unnecessarily if you haven't verified it. Yep. Yeah. It's really, it's now, getting quite scary though. Um, maybe a few years ago on Twitter, you'd see people retweeting things and you're like, oh, that's not true. But now I'm starting to notice more reputable people retweeting those things. They're not actually going to the source of what's going on. Yeah. 
It's like, no, you're, this is becoming part of the problem. Like when people see someone with the blue tick, they're verified. Mm -hmm. if, if they're tweeting it, well then that must be true. And, and unfortunately people aren't spreads. clicking the links when they, you know, they're not even reading the story, they're just seeing a headline and retweeting. Um, I just want to um, show a couple more quick examples about, you know, it's not just people who are trying to fool the journalists these days. There's incredible advances in technology. I'm going to show you some pretty scary stuff. Um, there's amazing advances in artificial intelligence. You'll hear more about that in the next session. But there's um, all different kinds of ways that people can manipulate voices and faces and videos to make it look like someone has actually said something when they haven't. So I'll just show you a few quick examples. The first one is called Liarbird, and it's a Canadian startup that lets you train and generate a voice using just one minute of audio. If we just play this first one. Hey, Tom, have you heard about this new technology? Are you speaking about this new algorithm to copy voices? Yes, it is developed by a startup called Liarbird. This is huge. They can make us say anything now, really anything. The good news is that they will offer the technology to anyone. This is huge. How does their technology work? Hey, guys, I think that they use deep learning and artificial neural <laughs> networks. Hillary is right, and I can tell you that their team is great. I wish them good luck. I'm sure they will do a good job. So recognize those voices? I think that, that was conversation Donald Trump's real happened. voice, though, in that mm. he was actually asked to take part. It's, it's, his, it's his real <laughs> voice. They, they've just reconstructed it. So they can create a 1,000 seconds in half a second, sorry, a 1,000 sentences in half a second, and they can even infuse the speech with emotion so they can make people sound more angry or more sympathetic or stressed out. The next example is a facial reenactment technique, which is really quite scary. As we can see, we are able to generate a realistic and convincing reenactment result. You can see the guy in the top Here there we show is a close up of the footage from the previous live reenactment. The input video stream is shown on the left. Note that the target actor is re rendered in a neutral pose. On the right, we can see the final output of our method. It's incredible, isn't it? Mm. And then I'll show you this um, very, very well known by now a deep fake video. Um, from Get Out director Jordan Peele and his brother-in-law, Jonah Peretti of BuzzFeed. And this is uh, a PSA from Obama. We're entering an era in which our enemies can make it look like anyone is saying anything at any point in time, even if they would never say those things. So, uh, for instance, they could have me say things like, uh, I don't know, uh, Killmonger was right, or uh, Ben Carson is in the sunken place, or how about this? Simply, President Trump is a total and complete dipshit. <laughs> now, you see, I would never say these things, at least not in a public address, but someone else would. Someone like Jordan Peele. This is a dangerous time. Moving forward, we need to be more vigilant with what we trust from the Internet. That's a time when we need to rely on trusted news sources. Okay. It may sound basic, but how we move forward. So you can see, um, obviously, it's not perfect at the moment. That took 56 hours to make. But this technology is rapidly advancing. And so within the next couple of years, we're going to start to really have to become quite skeptical of what we see online. All right, Kev? <laughs> Kev thinks we need to be that already. Um, also, the other thing that we are experiencing, and particularly on um, Twitter and Facebook, is bots. Has anyone ever seen a Twitter bot, to your knowledge? No? Um, these became a huge problem. And the, the FBI is still investigating the extent to which Russian-powered bots on Twitter were able to influence the discourse around elections. Um, millions of people were exposed to tweets that were actually controlled by Russia. And they're all connected in these very sophisticated systems called botnets. Do you guys know how to identify a bot? Would you know what to look for? Sometimes I think, I mean, there are patterns like you can look at frequency of posts, um, keywords, so bots tend to speak like each other. They tend to follow the same thing. So if you grab a sample, you can generally tell. Um, there's tools online like Bot Check Me. Um, that's free. I think that was developed by Cornell. Um, I might be wrong, might have been someone else, but 
you can just throw it through and it gives you a probability that they're bots. But every once in a while, I'll look at an account and go, yep, that's a bot. And then I go through the history manually and I check, nope, it's just an idiot. So, <laughs> no, which is the extremely depressing. <laughs> yeah, it's like, oh, God, that's so much worse There's than a bot. There's a lot of them too on Twitter, isn't there? <laughs> <laughs> so is it the same as a troll or we're talking? No, see, bots just, are fully uh, automated. So oh. bots, bots, I mean, they're, they're, you know, humans and build them, they're, but they're automated systems. They're very easy to make now. Um, if, I, if I was to mm. give you guys a link, you could all try it. Probably make some of your own. They wouldn't be as sophisticated as the ones coming Please out. Please don't make your own. Oh, bots. Don't, <laughs> but not all of them. Not all of them are bad as well. Like so, yeah. the ABC has a has a bot yeah. on Facebook Messenger, which is designed to basically text you the news, yeah. and it reads as if it's a news editor who's just on a phone saying, "Oh, check out this news stories for today." Yeah. Um, and when they were building that bot, they realised that lots of people really thought it was a real person, and so they had to program a lot of responses to things like will you be my friend, or I love you, or thank you so much, how do you know so much about the news? <laughs> those kind of things. They actually had to program those responses in, and they still get lots and lots of people thinking it's just a person at the other end of the phone. And just a very, very busy person texting them in the, the news. <laughs> very busy person. We're all busy. At the end. Newsrooms are, are starting to deploy bots for good now. Um, I mean, all technology is just an extent of human intention. So um, in our newsroom, for example, we really want to cover militant extremists, so Islamic State, uh, Boko Haram. Um, and you know all the other kind of crazy ones. And what we did was because a lot of journalists can't speak Arabic or they're not very good at tracking um, psychopaths <laughs> across the internet. I mean, why would you be? So we actually developed these kind of bots that would uh, we programmed to kind of find keywords in certain places and it would come back with information every five to ten minutes. And that's how we found like the, where Islamic State's operating, what they're saying, who they're targeting, um, you know, whether they're talking about certain countries. They would, talk, they would mention Australia sometimes. Um, but if you were to do that with just normal people, it would take them days to do that. And mm. they'd have to learn Arabic, whereas this one we could program that algorithm in as mm. well. So, and it's becoming increasingly useful as well to tell stories. Mm. How are we going for time, everyone? Have we got another? 20 minutes. 20 minutes? OK, cool. All right. Um, now, I want to just switch a bit to a slightly more serious topic. Um, the the co-option of platforms by politicians globally. Yeah. Um, you know, bots is one thing. But then um, I've just got back from a week in Asia where they're having particular issues over there, um, particularly in places like the Philippines, where governments are using social networks to basically spread propaganda, huge disinformation campaigns. Um, President Duterte in the Philippines has um, call centres set up which are populated with trolls. Um, if people publish information about him he doesn't like, he will basically set an army of automated bots, humans, bloggers, who've got millions of followers on people that basically have messages that he doesn't like. And he's basically flooding the internet with, uh, with information in his favour. You've got a great example of... Uh, uh, from a few days ago, actually. So there was an anti Duterte march. I forgot where. I think it might have been Manila. Um, and people were holding these banners, which basically said, you know, protesting him. Within an hour, that photo was taken. Um, it was photoshopped with all the signs removed and putting in pro Duterte messages. And it was re uploaded onto these pro um, Duterte websites and blogs. And obviously, the pro ones are so much more bigger because they have so much more funding and resources. And so he, within the span of an hour, he was pretty much able to retake control of that narrative. Um, and that's the really, really horrifying thing with politicians taking control of this, because the point of journalism is that you know, we hold them to account. And when they have control of the narrative and when they have control of the message, um, suddenly everything that they do, there's no political price for mm. what happens. They can say and do whatever. And when we're having this conversation, at some point, um, he can just openly assassinate someone and he won't lose his job, mm. which is quite hard. And that is the real cost mm. of the end of journalism, that there is, we have no power to shame people mm. for what they do anymore. And that co-opting of the platforms is quite, you know, it's at some point they don't have to go through us anymore. Mm. There's no critical barrier mm. there. And that is the real danger. And, and it's, you... it's that lack of accountability. Like, you're even starting to see that in Australia. Um, I mean, we've had... Uh, uh, Pauline Hanson has, has um, been up front. She refuses to be interviewed by Fairfax or by the ABC. 
and her um, chosen method of communication, if it's not in a press conference, she will just upload a video to her own Facebook or to the One Nation Facebook page and disseminate it that way. And of course, there's no one challenging or questioning what she's saying in that, which is exactly why she, that's the way she likes to do it. People who are challenging are getting buried as mm. well, like, because that's the way the, the algorithms mm. work. Are the conditions right in Australia, do you think? I mean, I was, I was quite shocked by the amount of disinformation campaigns that were running across um, Asia. We've got Donald Trump basically describing every mainstream media outlet as fake news. He, he constantly attacks the press in the US and he's banning people from press conferences. Is this the kind of behaviour you think our politicians locally are going to be able to get away with in Australia? I think I th they would love to. I think they, um, I let's think they'd let's love be to. honest. Um, they, they'd probably have a lot harder time of it over here, I think. For, in Australia, we've got a few things going for us that America doesn't have. We firstly got a, a very strong public broadcaster, um, and it's also an incredibly well-trusted public broadcaster. Um, but also we've got compulsory voting, which is one of the things that really changes the dynamic in all sorts of far-reaching ways in places like the US, because a lot of the people who vote are the ones who are particularly partisan, and a lot of the people who are dis feel disconnected or don't feel particularly passionately one way or another, they just stay out of it. Whereas that's not an option here. So it's really, everyone is beholden to at least pay a little bit of attention to what's happening because they're going to have to vote at some stage anyway. Mm. I think our public is smarter as well. Uh, I think, I think, mm. can, <laughs> I, I think, I think we, give, we have to give you all way more, you know, way more credit because when people like Pauline Hanson say that they're not going to be questioned by ABC journalists, then that is a real... That's, that's alarming. She should not be in public office and politicians need to be held to account by journalists who are asking tough questions and when they don't want to answer those questions, then they shouldn't be doing, they shouldn't be voted in. Mm. And who, who are the people out there that are voting in Pauline Hanson? Um, so that, I think that's, and, and fake news is, is an excuse for criticism. Mm. And, and that, that's, that's our job. Mm. Our job is to hold people to account. And when you uh, fob off, an article that you don't like as fake news because it's critical of what you're doing. Mm. Um, and I think uh, the Australian public won't stand for that. Mm. Log logistically, there's a huge difference between us and the rest of the world as well. We're a huge country with a very small population. Um, generally, you'll find the disinformation is in very, very dense populated areas. India is a really, really perfect example of this. Um, and we're just too spread out. We're too far away. Um, we're just, one example is a lot of my research is about white nationalist groups. They're just not organised. They tend up to hate each other. They're quite narcissistic as well, so they don't want to work with each other. And they might all fly, literally fly on the same banner, like you know, United Patriots Front or you know, the KKK, whatever they want to call themselves. Um, but they don't communicate with each other as well. So we have that going for us. Um, it's a bit like Helm's Deep, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to just before we go to questions, and I hope I'm sure you have some questions after this session. Um, We've painted a pretty dire picture of what's going on out there in uh, online spaces, and I hope um, it's going <laughs> to make you a lot more critical of what you see online and not be so quick to share something if you're not sure of the source or the motivation behind it. Um, a question for you guys. What, what can people out in the community do to, uh, to help to educate themselves about what they should and shouldn't share, and where, where can people go for help about how do you, how do you find information on how to spot a bot and things like that? I think, sorry, you go ahead. Well, I, I think one thing, you know, people often talk about journalist ethics. I think all of us need to think about our own ethics in terms of what news we want to read. You know, a lot of the stuff, the news is published because people out there read it. Um, if you guys don't read it, that sends the strongest message you can to the publishers that that's not news you want to read. So if you don't like a story that's fat shaming Samantha Armitage, don't read it. That's the best thing you can possibly do. So I think one thing we should just look inside ourselves as to what kind of ethics we're happy to have. And I think there's just a level of accountability before you share things as well. Mm. Just don't share without reading things first. It sounds really basic, but you know, it's like what I was saying before, you see quite reputable people on Twitter sharing things before they've even done the most basic research into checking whether it's a hoax. I've got a so, terrible yeah. stat on that, that Columbia oh, no. University did a study <laughs> and they said 60% of all social media posts are shared without the link being clicked on. And that's by general people. <laughs> <laughs> I just think, I think, you know, um, 
you, you, you will know within yourself when you read something whether it's genuine or not or whether it you know, sits well with you. And I think, um, especially on our Facebook pages, don't rely on the algorithms to source you know, what you want to hear or read what you want to read. I think you need to really invest in your local and trusted news service like Channel 10. And um, the ABC. Uh, and the ABC. <laughs> <laughs> because <laughs> because we, 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 we are doing... Our whole day is, surround, is, is all about filtering, verifying, giving you the truth. And mm. it's, a tr it's trusted and, you know, and um, we, we don't take that for granted. And that's, that's all we do all day long, every day. Let me ask a question. Who here pays for their news? ABC doesn't count from your taxes. <laughs> no, that's not. This is a really, really horrifying. For, if anyone, the camera can't see, but there's like eight <laughs> hands up in the air. Huh? Who pays for Who news? Who pays for their news here? Who pays a subscription? Oh, no, yeah. there's... Oh, okay, that's a bit better. Maybe I was just quiet, there's but... still only about 10% of the room. Yeah, that... I mean, there's, there was a stat. Like, 60% of Australians will not pay for their news under any mm. circumstances. And when these journalistic institutions fall, um, you're going to really, really regret that. So the first thing you want to do is, doesn't matter who it is, whether it's only one or two, I pay for, like, five or six um, because, you know, I want to give back. But um, we need money. That's just, just as simple as that. It, we, there is so many economic forces here at work. So Wood Fairfax, for example, is a really great one. Um, you know, their revenue stream, they used to have free, which was jobs, um, cars. Car, cars and property. And they lost two of those streams down to property. And whatever money they were making was not being funneled into journalism. And yes, we can still produce journalism, but at a great cost. And being a really fearless journalist is expensive and it, there's a price for it. Mm. I mean, even defamation cases can cost up to 20, 40,000. Um, and that makes it really, really hard to tell really important stories. I mean, whenever we do an investigative story, there is no commercial gain for it. I don't know of a single story where it's, yep, I spent all this time and we made money from it. It's There's no. lots, of, lots of commercial pain. I mean, when um, Fairfax Media um, did a huge amount of stories, some of them with the ABC as well, uh, exposing the banks for their mistreatment of customers, the bank's response was to stop advertising with Fairfax Media. Yeah. So, yes, Domino's Pizza we need... was the same. They, they exposed a huge amount of um, exploitation of workers across the whole Domino's Pizza chain. Mm. Domino's stopped advertising with Fairfax Media. Mm. And uh, so many journalists have these stories as well. We go after someone knowing it's going to cost us jobs, but yeah. we do it anyway. And the people who remain are there for personal reasons. And the least that we could do is actually pay their wages because we need to do that as well. Mm. Um, so that would be my first most important thing, pay for your news. Okay. Does anyone have any questions? And please, if you're going to ask a question, make it a question, not a statement. I'll take that as a comment. <laughs> this yeah. lady in the front here. Um, you might just want to wait for the microphone. It's just coming your way. I was, I was just wondering if you could comment on blogs and podcasts as a source of news. What would you like to know about them? Well, I really just as a source of news that journalists who are perhaps got integrity, who have lost their jobs, who might choose to be working uh, through more independent uh, means, and whether that, as audience, whether that is feasible, you know, a group of journalists, what you think of that new trend? And for instance, as a podcast has come out of. Uh, Melbourne uh, about the Kimberley story oh, yep. that's going on. Yep. I mean, that's a current one. I think um, the economics are a bit tricky to make a living out of on podcasting in Australia. I think it's a popular medium, um, but the market is pretty small here at the moment, and to actually survive on a full-time wage would be extremely difficult. I think it's one of those things you do for the love of it because you want mm. to tell those stories and because you think it's important personally, which is, I think it's really good when people do that. Yeah, and it comes back trend. to what Kevin was saying before as well. Unless people are willing to pay for it, mm. it's going to be challenging to do. So if you value it, pay for it. Mm. Um, question in the front here? Thank you. My only question is, what we're, where we are right now, apart from a subscription to Guardian and watching ABC a lot, um, I don't really have any way, apart from maybe giving you eggs or something. <laughs> we'll take anything. <laughs> to, to, to pay people who are doing this wonderful service. I really respect a lot of journos, mm. but I don't know how to contribute to them. It, it used to be a lot easier when we actually had print. Um, don't mean to sound like an old white man, but it, it used to be. Um, you know, even with the, when Fairfax moved and other organizations moved to the dis digital subscription model, oh, sorry, digital model, 
hugely successful, but not very profitable. Mm. Um, one, click on the links. There is a bit of click revenue that we do get from there. So that's one. Mm. Two, I mean, I think at the moment we're obsessed with metrics in the sense that we're looking at how many clicks there is. But something that we don't measure in terms of news is engagement um, properly. I mean, is it part of the public conversation? You know, um, I think it's really, really hard where we want your support and we love your support, but it doesn't quantify it or we're not able to monetize it in a weird way. And that sounds really, really cold, but that's just something that there is a failure. And I feel like that's changing, hopefully, soon, um, as different kind of experimental revenue models come in. But in terms of that, just rate us. Um, if you like a particular story, you can send us a letter or tweet at us. Um, journalists are egotistical monsters. Um, so we love getting all that really, really great feedback, and we will ignore or the bad feedback as well. It's just who we are. Wait, getting, getting a nice letter? <laughs> yeah, a nice letter is great. I, I would love to get one of those one day. What's that like? <laughs> way, yeah. Yeah. Everyone's, everyone's busy. Like, yeah. the, the, best thing, the best thing you can do is to read the sources you value and don't read the sources you don't. Yeah. Um, mm. If you can subscribe to the sources mm. that you value, if, they give, if, if there's an option to do that, then, then do it because you will be like making a tangible difference in, mm. in allowing that source to continue doing but, what it does. But do open up to different sources as well. Don't just read. Mm. I mean, even if you don't like it, it is valuable to see it. I mean, one of the things that kind of came up ahead of Brexit and the election of Donald Trump was like, oh, you know, where were all the warning signs? It's like, well, you blocked and unfriended all of them. Like, they're there. <laughs> uh, but you just purposely put that out of your mind. Yeah. So it's do kind of keep a, an open mind. It's a tricky yeah. situation because you want, you know, support the outlets that you trust but also make sure you don't stay in your bubble too much. Mm. Yeah. You, know, you don't want to just get the same things kind of fed back to you. Yeah. I think every time you read a, um, a Guardian story, and I'm sure you've noticed, at the end of every Guardian story, they put in a little spiel saying, you've read this, it's important, support us. And after I saw that a few times, it started to sink in, and I thought, all right, OK, you can have some cash. That was a really good story. And they have actually done that globally and they've managed to find a way to prop up their business because they're, they're operated with a trust. Their money is going to run out at some point. Journalism is expensive, like you said. It's actually really, really hard to do the kind of work that they do because it's expensive, it takes a lot of time. And investigative journalism in particular takes even longer and it's really hard to convince the bosses, you know, this, this could take two months to do this story, but the social value of it is really high. But that sort of work is becoming increasingly scarce. And if, uh, when it comes to the ABC, if you value what the ABC does, then um, you know, share our stories. Tell, tell other people that you've seen something that's worth mm. reading. But also, if you don't like what's happening in terms of funding for the ABC, then um, you know, talk to your MP about it or mm. sign petitions. Th do those kind of things. Make, make people know that this is something you value. We've got a question in the middle there. You were saying earlier on that you lack resources, so you buy sometimes news from bigger um, networking in, in the world. And I've heard rumors that ABC buy some news from Al Jazeera. Is that true? Um, I, there, there's or all sorts access of. the news that Al Jazeera starts first, because my concern is that Al Jazeera is extremely biased uh, a thing, and they don't reflect the news. They have a lot of fake news and it's seeping through the ABC. The ABC used to, I was so proud of being a regular customer and it was objective, but lately, when it comes to the conflict of Israel and, and Gaza, <clears throat> it's very, very one-sided. They, they, they say half of the truth, not the whole truth. Mm -hmm. And then you get this false impression of what's going on there. And somebody told me that's because they buy the news from Al Jazeera. There's certainly all sorts of places that the ABC syndicates content from. So when it comes to international content, there's Associated Press and Reuters and, and all sorts of wire services. I'm not sure if we actually continue to syndicate from out of zero, out of zero or not. I'm not sure if that has continued. I, I'm, I don't know, to be honest. Sorry. Hmm. But it's certainly, I don't think it's... Oh, OK. Uh, I, can, I think I can answer that. That one is that we would... Israel and um, Palestine, but that one is an extremely complicated thing. But we get down to the sources. Um, we try to speak as, to as many people as possible. Um, I'm happy to defend Al Jazeera's reputation here. I work with them sometimes, and they're very, very good at what they do. Um, in terms of the Middle East, um, they have a certain point of view. I, I will admit that, but so do all organizations. Um, to verify that, it's, as I said, it's complicated. It's easier now. 
mm. um, due, to, due to the internet. But mm. we just we, sorry, we just we just have to move on to another question. I'll speak to you afterwards. Yeah, yeah. there's a man we'll, up the we'll back. We'll take that one offline. Um, yeah. This this gentleman here at the front. Sorry, oh. this the, next and, and then the man at the back. He's had his hand up since the beginning. Oh, has he? Just, okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's just so tired. Now. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> we'll come to you next. Mm. We'll, do, we'll just we'll oh. go here first, and then we'll do one more question at the back there. Uh, one of the trends that worries me is the lack of originators in journalism these days. When I used to work in Fairfax newsrooms, um, the great bulk of the stories that we generated were from, you know, primary um, initiation by ourselves. Uh -huh. what, one of the things I've seen coming through the discussion this morning reinforces my view that so much news now is something that someone else has initiated. Um, and we pinch copy and even the need to verify stuff mm. suggests to me that we're just not, we don't have the, the, the uh, decline in resourcing in journalism ha has led to this lack of origination. Radio newsrooms are notorious for this. Mm. They hardly originate any, you know, uh, anything themselves. Mm. I'd just like the panel to comment on that. Sure. I think that's I, th I think that's true, and that there are some newsrooms and some uh, journalism products that have actually built a business model around repackaging stuff from other people. Um, you know, the Daily Mail would be quite upfront in acknowledging that's pretty much their business model is is repackaging stories that others have done. I think the best thing you can do is look for stories where it's clear that they have themselves spoken to real people, and make those the ones that you go to. You know, the the best way you can hurt um, publications you disagree with is to not use them mm. and reward the ones that you do value by going to them more. Mm. I think we're hearing the, de um, the death knell of uh, investigative reporters. You mentioned Kate, Kate uh, McClymont um, from Fairfax and she, she broke the Don Burke, all well, the Don Burke stuff, I'm pretty sure. And um, yeah, so investigative journos had the time um, and set the pace in terms of, you know, uh, creating that. So unfortunately, that's you know, it's 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 a sad it's it's sad. And I, um, uh, you know, a lot of our, our, our newsrooms are very reactive. Uh, you know, we just report on the stories of the day, and there's not a lot of investigation for you know, un, you know, uncovering you know stories that might run in a month, in a week's time or so. So yeah. I, I will add just really quickly. Um, some of the best journalists, as I said before, some of the best journalism that I've seen has come out in the past few years. It's not dead. Um, yes, it's a lot more reactive, but there is still a lot of value in that as well. I mean, mm. would we have covered Syria? I mean, that's entirely reactive. We can't get into the country, um, and, but we've managed yeah. to cover it quite well. And, 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 and with, with all uh, newsrooms looking at metrics and who's clicked on what story in terms of a way of assessing the value of a story, the monetary value of a story, that does actually reinforce investigative content because if you've got a story that no one else has got, it's going to get much more people reading it because it's not a story that everyone has. Mm. So there is actually, people are starting to realise that there is actually a monetary value to investing in this kind of stuff. To original work. To yeah. original work, exactly. Yeah, and the ABC does continue to fund and it protects its investigative journalism. There's an aged care investigation running at the moment which is very, very, very resource heavy. Um, but they do it because it's an important story and so they've allocated space in a very busy newsroom to covering that story exclusively for a period of time. So it does still happen. Um, one more question at the back. Uh, first of all, uh, thanks very much for your, uh, your conversation. It's really nice to see stuff like this in Perth. Um, uh, this question, I don't mean it to be barbed in any way. I really appreciate you guys uh, coming and talking, but I would be curious to know is your, the person who pays your wages, I would assume in each of your, uh, uh, your different places that you work, it's pre predominantly an advertising model, would that be correct? Um, not, no, not, me. not for two not of for us. Flip and not, for two of us. <laughs> not for me either. <laughs> because yeah. I, something that I've noticed is when you read quality uh, papers, the degree of clickbait in publications that previously, you, you just can't believe that's the standard associated with with, mm. with that reporting. I think it's pushing people towards more of the sort of Patreon models and I just was wondering if you had any thoughts on uh, that type of model. For example, Quillette, the, uh, it's, it's, uh, Patreons are, or its patrons are just people paying directly there and there's no advertising and, and I find myself increasingly more wanting to support those types of platforms? Or just I, I guess I can speak a, from a commercial point of view where we are paid by our advertisers, it's all ratings based, uh, but that in no way affects our editorial decisions at all. Um, 
and it's yeah, you shake your head, but it's true. Just just because you know we might be advertising some kind of security system or something in the next bracket of ads doesn't mean we're going to be doing all putting all the crime stories right before you know. Or the, it just doesn't not come into it. Like a lot we, of time for editorial, like we don't know when that's happening. We don't know who we, we actually don't know who our advertisers are. If that if that um, helps at all, we have no idea. You know, our sales is completely separate um, to anything, so it, it affects editorial decisions. Not one bit. And with the clickbait argument, that's actually becoming less and less of a thing because um, early on, and I'm talking probably a good five years ago, um, advertisers were buying advertising inventory on websites based on the number of click throughs. Um, increasingly, that model is changing both from the newspaper side of things and in the advertising industry, and people are valuing more what's called engagement which is how much people are actually connecting with the content and spending time on the content and how much the advertising is relevant to them. So when you've got a clickbait headline, and that's kind of, you know, John went down to the shop and you'll never guess what happened next. And then you click in, it's like, he bought a cucumber. Um, so <laughs> it's, it's when, it's when the, the story, or it's when the promise of the headline, the story doesn't live up to the promise of the headline. And what happens, the, the behaviour of that is, you click into the story, you realise it was just a story about a cucumber, you go off and do something else. So you spend a fraction of the time on that page. When you've got a story that legitimately compels someone to click into the story and then they spend time on that, the engagement, so the time spent on the story, is a lot higher, and that is actually more valuable to advertisers because the advertising on that story, if the um, publication has set their systems up right, is going to be more relevant to that person and they're more likely to click on because the number of people who actually firstly read and secondly click through an advert on a web page is a fraction of a percent. It's really, really, really small and it doesn't actually generate much money at all. And so there's actually a very little um, monetary argument or economic argument for clickbaiting. Um, and most publications have actually wised up to that now. And it's only the ones that have decided, well, we're just going to go with as much as we possibly can getting people to click into their stories and get as much hits up as possible and hope that that tiny, tiny fraction happens to click onto an advert. They're the only ones that might see an appeal on it, but to be honest, the legitimacy of that as a business model is getting less and less and less. Okay, that's a good spot to finish on. Thank you, everyone. Um, please thank our panel um, for this fantastic discussion. <laughs>